Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited about today's webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Nambri country here in Canberra and pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, these webinars, we do do them at least weekly. For example, this week we've got three on. So to find all the details for those, you can head on over to our website at australiainstitute.org.au and uh, you can find the details there to sign up for all of those. Just a few tips before we begin today to help things run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can type in questions for our panelists and also upvote other people's questions um, and comment on them as well. Um, and please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And we don't have to do it often, but we will if we have to. And finally, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded. If you've got a duck out for any reason or you're uh, uh, missing any of it or want to revisit it, that'll go up on our YouTube channel within um, hopefully the next 12 to 24 hours. Thanks so much for joining us today. This webinar really couldn't be timelier. Uh, there is new modelling out today from the Burner Institute on how hospitals will cope when cases in New South Wales hit 2,000 a day. And uh, we couldn't be more delighted to have Professor Brendan Crabb from the Burner Institute here with us today. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Ebony. Great to be here. And joining him in conversation will be Richard Dennis, our Chief Economist. Hi, Richard. Hi, Eb. Um, and today, hey, Brendan. we are going to be talking about the National COVID Plan and why we need not just vaccines, but also our test, trace, isolate and quarantine system operating on all cylinders, as well as other public health, me um, health measures to really properly manage COVID um, as we start vaccinating more of the population and start looking at loosening restrictions. So some of what we're hearing in the news, I think has been rather simplistic. Um, you know, I've had comments from the prime minister about we've got to get out of the cave, um, so to speak, that springs to mind. Um, but today we wanted to really get into some of the assumptions that's in the Doherty modeling on which the national plan is based um, and really um, unpack some of, I think the complexities and assumptions that are in it that aren't really getting a lot of airtime um, in the media um, to this point. So um, yeah, welcome Professor Crabb, welcome Richard. Um, let's kick off. Um, I wonder if I could start with you, Brendan, and just, um, I guess, commenting on where we find ourselves at this point in time. Are you a little bit concerned with kind of how simplistic the debate has, has gotten compared to, I guess, what you must know is the complexity of, of the situation? Well, thanks so much, uh, uh, Ebony and Richard, for, for having me today. It is very timely, and, and thank you, everybody, for attending. And I, and I should start by explaining sort of, before I answer your question, Ebony, just who I am and who I'm not, because um, one, one of my favourite movies was a movie called Paper Mask, and it was it, it's where this, um, this orderly, someone mis mistook this orderly for a doctor, and he spent the rest of the, episode, the, rest of the movie pretending to be a doctor, and he actually turned out to be to be okay. And I'm often mistaken for um, I've been called an epidemiologist so many times in in the last year and a half, and um, I've stopped correcting people, even though I'm so far from an epidemiologist. I'm a virologist by background, a molecular biologist really, and my my interest is why pathogens are pathogens, uh, you know, as opposed to microorganisms that don't cause disease at a molecular level. That's my personal interest, and and as time's gone on, and the reason I joined the Burnett. Um, 13 years ago, I became interested in what, in how pathogens are linked to human development, really, to, to you know, how infectious diseases and poverty are so inextricably linked. Uh, and, and I became very interested in, in, in the issue of pandemics, both from malaria, the one that started 50,000 years ago when, when the malaria parasite came across from, from a non-human primate into, into humans and still causes so much, or probably killed 10% of all the people who have ever lived. Um, through to through to HIV, the last big pandemic, and, and now now to this one. So it's a great interest to me, but I don't come as an epidemiologist and modeler and economist and so on. So what you hear from me is interpreting a lot of what I hear, my own team's um, uh, knowledge. Of course, we have many of those skills um, at the Burnett, but um, I just didn't want to pretend paper mask style that I was more than 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 I'm not. Look, 
the Australia was going incredibly well in the in a circumstance that is the biggest disruption since World War II. Um, human disruption, you know, challenge to our our life and well-being, and challenge economically. You now we're talking about five to ten trillion dollar impact and so on. Um, Australia was going remarkably well because of this strategy of of aggressive suppression to no community transmission. And of course, half of Australia still is in this, in this boat. Um, but all of a sudden, uh, very quickly, the New South Wales outbreak got out of control. And, uh, and that's led to at least Victoria and New South Wales and who knows others as they continually get um, uh, assaulted effectively from incursions from, from those two states as to how long they'll last. We now have COVID circulating. Um, we've effectively given up in New South Wales and Victoria on that uh, COVID zero status, you know, and, if, and of course, let's be blunt, the only way to live freely um, when before you've got very high vaccination rates is by being COVID zero. There's no other. Uh, model. COVID zero is the freedom model, not the lockdown model that it's often portrayed as um, for, for whatever reason. So we are in trouble now because 31% of Australians are doubly vaccinated. We're going to talk about countries that are well up around 80% of the total population vaccinated. Uh, that, so we have a long way to go. Um, in, in New South Wales, the rate of vaccination is truly impressive. It's, it's incredible. And so uh, and let's hope that that happens here in Victoria and then ultimately in the other states. But the bottom line is we've now got um, full lockdowns going on in two states, plus full vaccine rollouts, and we still have threats to our hospital uh, system. Uh, and, of course, I hate that phrase in a way because what we're really talking about is, is threats to lives and to, to health um, remembering that every death is associated with five or so near deaths and people who will take a long time, if ever, to recover fully from having been on a ventilator and 10 times more of those that have been um, very, very sick in hospital and many more who have been in hospital less sick than that. Um, it's, a, it's a huge problem uh, for uh, Australia as we stand at the moment. There's, there's no obvious way out before Christmas of lockdown except to vaccinate like crazy, and as the premise of this, this um, webinar is, to do other things as well. And the bottom line is that, before I throw back to you, Ebony and Richard, is that of all the models, ours, Doherty's, many others, and of all the real world experiences, they say two things. The vaccines are unexpectedly, in my view, who's worked on vaccines my whole life, unexpectedly good. We're, there's an embarrassment of riches. They are incredibly good. Um, pretty much doesn't matter which of the high-profile vaccines at, at, pre at preventing you from getting seriously sick. Not perfect, but incredibly high rates, inc including of the new variants that have emerged, including of this Delta variant. So they, they are spectacular. Vaccines can be better than these, and they can certainly be worse. And for many of the pandemics that I'm interested in, there's either no vaccine or a hopeless vaccine, malaria, HIV, as the two cases in point. And there was every chance we would never get a coronavirus vaccine. So, you know, by April, May last year, 2020, um, that's what we were planning for, the potential that we may never get a vaccine. So we've got spectacular vaccines. But the other thing the models say is that, you know, below extremely high levels, and we can talk about what those might be, um, they are not enough. So the, the United Kingdom, for example, that has sort of 64% or so of its whole population vaccinated, it's got a lot more than that immune, it, to some extent, immune in inverted commas because they've been infected, maybe up towards 95% of their population have either been vaccinated and or infected. And they still have towards 1,000 hospitalizations a day and a seven day average of 110, 115 deaths a day, which is a lot less than they would have, but it does indicate to you, all the real world examples indicate that vaccines are both brilliant and not enough to stop serious threat 
to health in our community and to our health system more widely. And of course, as soon as you threaten the health system, you threaten all the non-COVID effects of COVID. It's a very long answer to your question, but it gets to the kind of nub of the issue. It sure does. And uh, I really take your point there about how amazing the vaccines that we've got actually are. I do remember Norman Swan talking about, you know, if we got one at all last year, at the beginning of the year, you know, even 60% effectiveness would, would be better than nothing. And uh, yeah, they're much better than that. Um, yeah. Richard, I wanted to come to you next. As I said, I, I feel like the debate that we're in at the moment, certainly from a lot of politicians seem to be just much more simplistic than the problem that we're grappling with. I know you've taken a look at um, the Doherty Institute modeling and in some of the assumptions behind it. Um, what is it that people need to know about what's actually in that modeling compared to what we're hearing from politicians? Hmm. Um, thanks, Eb. Uh, well, I guess it's no surprise that the same Prime Minister that gave us technology, not taxes, is kind of determined to say there's just one thing, there's one thing we need to do to get on top of this COVID, and it's for you to go and get yourself vaccinated. Right. So, uh, you know, let's talk about climate for a second. The main thing that drives technology change is the tax. Like, it's not a choice. You need both. And when it comes to suppressing a virus as, uh, as virulent and as deadly as this one, as Brendan said, we, we need, we, you know, we need the full court press. We, we need to do everything we can, because even with countries that have got much higher rates of vaccination than us, they're still seeing a lot of people getting very sick and a lot of people dying. So when you read the Doherty modelling, and I encourage people to have a look, like really, it's, it's, it's not a fun read, but I assure you, if you sit down and read it, you, you'll get the gist of most of it. And what the Doherty modelling makes crystal clear is that the number one, uh, the number one thing that has controlled the virus to date is our testing, tracing, isolation and quarantine system. And if we cast our mind back to the Ruby Princess landing in Sydney and putting hundreds of people with COVID into Australia, no one was vaccinated at that point in time. Not a single Australian, because there was no vaccine. The only reason that the Ruby Princess didn't basically spread across the entire country and effectively infect nearly all of us by now is because our testing and tracing system was so good. And it's worked here, it's worked in New Zealand, it works. And what the Doherty Institute really modelled was the assumption that we keep everything under control and then we vaccinate and vaccinate and vaccinate and then we gently start to open up from with a very small number of cases with a highly effective testing and tracing system in place and a whole bunch of other measures like wearing masks and you know, still not having large venues open. All of this is quite explicit in the Doherty modelling. And if we do all of those things, we might be able to avoid some lockdowns, maybe a bit if we're lucky. <laughs> so we've got this full suite of measures in the Doherty modeling, one of the most important of which is our testing and tracing system. And if we add vaccination on top of that, we get to potentially a happy place. But what we've done in the last three weeks, it's an amazing feat of politics, is say, well, forget about the, the, the quarantine failures, forget about the fact that we've already let a small outbreak become a very large outbreak. If we just keep vaccinating, everything will be all right. And I'm choosing my words carefully. That's not what the Doherty modelling says. And we have to vaccinate. As Brendan said, they're incredibly effective. We're so lucky they're so effective. We're so lucky we've got some. They, you know, we, we have been slow off the mark. Other countries are way ahead of us. Good that we're catching up. But for all of the talk about 70% and 80% vaccination, let's just look at the fact that we're below 40% today, 40% nationwide. It's only 40%, 41% in New South Wales, but we're already starting to open up. So we can't say, oh, but Doherty says things are fine at 70 or 80, doesn't actually say that to justify that it's okay that we're beginning to open up now at 40. We have not modelled the scenario we're in, not even close. Yeah. Um, Brendan, there's also a lot of talk, I guess, not just about opening up, but kind of um, uh, 
lifting the state border restrictions, for example, um, and, and those types of things. Um, is that in the Doherty modelling as well? No, well, Doherty models essentially doesn't assume any borders. Um, so, you know, that, that's a level of, of granularity that, that isn't there. I mean, one of the reasons why Australia has been so successful is that we understood the value of border control and, and our federation, the quirk of our federation allowed that to happen at a, at a state level as well. I would argue it needs to happen at a city level. So when Sydney, for example, had a decent outbreak, they needed to protect the region by blocking themselves off. That's what a ring of steel is. So border controls are very powerful when you don't yet have high vaccination. Um, you know, of course, you want to desperately get to a position where you don't need them, um, but but they are protecting a very large portion of the Australian population at the moment. In in Melbourne, for example, where I am, the most important thing at the moment is to get the regions back to COVID zero and then protect those regions. Um, obviously, we want to keep the numbers low in Melbourne, but we do need to protect the regions so that the, the more vulnerable populations out there, especially with less effective health systems. Um, can can function in a COVID zero environment. So no, the Doherty model assumes evenness, and there's some important principles there. You know these these figures of seventy and eighty percent, and 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 you know there's two sides to that, and the good side and the worrying side. The good side is you do need targets. I'm all for targets, but I mean of course seventy and eighty percent are nice round figures. Uh, they the the actual precise number that something is likely to be effective at, of course, is not 70 and 80, but, but it's useful to have targets. The population's got something to go for. I, I, I like that, with the, but with the serious caveats as to what that actually means that Richard's outlined. Um, but what isn't talked about is, is who's high and who's low. You know, can we open if regional communities are at a much lower rate or if disadvantaged community um, is at a much lower rate um, or, you know, or a, a cold community or whatever it might be is a much, I would say most definitely not. We've got to get uh, the, the, the rates of vaccination uh, even. Um, but look, it's been, a, it's been a big lesson, one of the, the big lessons of the pandemic. You know, the science, I think, is one of them, the value and power of science. Um, but the other is how inequity drives um, pandemics. Uh, you know, it's driven in this country, it's driven around the world. And, uh, and you know, so, so borders, um, uh, uh, sub-communities and so on need to be taken into account, that level of granularity. Look at what's going to happen in New South Wales. If things turn out well, we have a heavily vaccinated state, I hope with a really good vaccine plus plan. So that's great. Let's say that turns out really well. Um, but the rest of the country, I think in Victoria, we're six weeks behind or something like that in vaccination. What are we going to do? Um, how's that going? To, you can't just open New South Wales, which would obviously still have COVID, where the other places don't. It's a really serious issue that um, I'm not sure we're fully grappled with. Uh, but you can't just say to Queensland, you know, let the virus in, even though you're miles behind uh, on, on your vaccine uh, rollout. And that's not an accusation of them. There's, there's a bunch of reasons why, why that's the case. Um, so some real challenges there around uniformity, everything Richard said around test, trace, and isolate, public health measures, the need for plus is, uh, is, is absolutely set in stone. You've got to have those things, um, but you can't leave some people behind while others are advancing. That doesn't work either. Yeah, and it's quite clear that, for example, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities have been left behind despite supposedly being a priority for the vaccine rollout. And I've certainly noticed at least the New South Wales Chief Health Officer really bringing attention to that issue of equity. You know, is 80% across the population good enough? Well, um, yeah, not if um, if it's leaving out those vulnerable populations um, to begin with. And Richard, I know we've done a lot of work at the Australia Institute about how neoliberalism helps drive the pandemic because, you know, people with casual and part-time jobs that have no sick leave, that must go to work, that can't work from home. Um, there's a lot of uh, forces driving um, driving that inequality and, and making things worse. But I did want to come back to the test, trace, isolate and 
quarantine because you've talked about the importance of it, but essentially in New South Wales with the case numbers as big as they are, am I correct? Like, it seems like we're already overwhelming that TTIQ system. And that's one of the key assumptions in there that it's operating at a, at a high level. How concerning is that? I was very concerned because, again, we're completely in uncharted territories. We, we talk about the Doherty modelling all day long, but we don't talk about the fact that it modelled a scenario that is unrelated to the world we currently live in. Now, that's not a criticism of the modellers who did their job back in June based on what they thought was reasonable back in June. But when we're using the assumptions made back in June to justify policy decisions that are being made in New South Wales and indeed Australia today. And that's just, I would suggest, unhelpful and even inappropriate. So in the Doherty modelling, they, uh, as I said, you know, one of the main drivers of the whole model is the effectiveness of our testing and tracing because it's so effective. And they, had, they have kind of two scenarios in their model. One where they have what they call optimal testing and tracing based on New South Wales's performance last year, which was very, very good. And then they have something which they call partial TTIQ, test, trace, isolate, quarantine, partially effective, which they calibrated towards uh, what happened in Melbourne during the second wave when they had 700 cases a day. And that was a lot of pressure for the tracing system to come under. So according to the Doherty modelling, they say, all right, well, we know that it might come under some pressure. It won't be optimal all the time. So it might get so bad Australia-wide that it gets as bad as it was in Melbourne during the peak of their second wave. Well, it's far worse than that already. And we're nowhere near 80% vaccination. So, uh, so if it, the, the model was calibrated for the ability of the contact traces to keep up with all of the contacts of 700 new cases a day. In New South Wales, they've had 1,500 cases a day. I think today they've had 12 or 1,300. Um, they, they had 80% of their cases unlinked, 80% unlinked. Now, the thing with Delta is it moves really quickly. So if it takes you three or four days to get in touch with people and say you were in proximity of someone that had it three or four days ago, it's too late. You have to, by definition, you have to stay ahead of it. You've got to be getting to people before they become infectious to say, stay home, stay home, stay home. So unfortunately, New South Wales is already way past that point. And that's why it's so important. I think a lot of people have misunderstood and be interested in Brendan's thoughts on this. But in Victoria, while Daniel Andrews has said, look, maybe we can't get it back down to zero, he's adamant that they've still got to try as hard as they can to, con to contain it because presumably he knows that if he lets it blow out the way it blew out in New South Wales, then you blow out that testing and tracing capacity. And once you blow that, you're, you're, the, the, the vaccines alone are just not enough to, to suppress the growth of it. So we have to be careful to not think that just because Victoria isn't aiming for zero cases, that it's going to let it rip. Nothing the Premier has said suggests that, and there's lots of good reasons for that, including that if you let it get too big, you can basically give up on testing and tracing. And, and what the Doherty modelling says is testing and tracing is as important as vaccinating around 60% of the population. That's how powerful the traces are. Yeah. Did you want to respond to that, Brendan? Oh, yeah. Just, just to say there, there is a... There's such a, so much great detail in the, in the Doherty report, but there's one figure that you... I recommend everyone look at. It's figure one, effectively. There's a 1.1 and a 1.2, and it illustrates the point Richard's made. It effectively has three different coloured blocks um, of controls that, uh, that are going to get the transmission potential of the virus below one. That means it's an epidemic in decline as opposed to an epidemic that's increasing. In New South Wales and Victoria at the moment, um, the, the transmission potential is above one. Um, if we were doing nothing with Delta, it would be six. So every person would transmit to six other people. Right, so what's happening in New South Wales and in Victoria is suppressing that enormously down. And this figure says there's three things that are doing that. There were only two things prior to vaccines, um, but there's three things. And, and one is the test, trace, isolate and quarantine. They have a colour that, that matches that with very baseline density limit um, measures that will probably continue. So it's mixed up with those those two, um, those two things. Then it has a colour for vaccines, and then it has 
a uh, green colour for lockdowns, um, light, medium and heavy lockdowns. And what is amazing there on these three different colours of this, of this light colour for TTIQ, the blue for vaccination and the green for um, lockdowns, is how small the vaccine box is. Um, it isn't this dominant box that, that um, makes all the impact on your transmission potential. Uh, at 50% coverage, it's, it's less than a third of the impact compared to TTIQ and, and lockdowns, which is why we're in lockdown at the moment, of course, uh, in, both, in both states. And, and of course, there are lots of different sorts of lockdown. But uh, So the idea is that you grow vaccine coverage to drop the green, which is lockdown, uh, and not need it again. You know, they need it less and less and less and eventually not need it at all. But the, the rest of it, the, the test, trace, isolate and quarantine, this massive kind of third of the, of the effort in dropping transmission potential um, remains, that and basic public health um, measures. So, so the end game here is a high enough vax to, to do away with the need to lock down, to be able to largely open our borders internally and externally, and to have non-disruptive um, measures like test, trace and isolate, um, like mask wearing, you know, like better ventilated um, uh, buildings and so on. That's, that's the end game. Getting there is still an enormously hard path. We haven't talked about this, the 70 and 80 percent figures yet, but the real world examples say that those figures as a percentage of adult population, so that means 70 is more like 55, 80 is more like 65 percent of the whole population aren't enough to do away with the need for lockdowns. Um, when you get up to 80% of the whole population, different ball game. So, so it's, it's an incredibly descriptive figure, 1.1 and 1.2 in the Doherty. If you only read one thing, it tells you the importance of more than just vaccination. Yeah, I wanted to ask because I don't, I'm not sure that people are necessarily familiar with what PLUS is. So we've talked about testing, everyone's familiar with the big testing clinics, the contact traces, like we all know what's going there, and isolate and quarantine, you know, if you've had a swab or a test, people are familiar with that. But what else is in the PLUS? You talked about ventilation there. Um, I know social distancing, mask wearing, that type of thing. What other things? I know Victoria, for example, has talked about looking at the ventilation in schools, for example. Mm. What are some of those other things that are plus? <laughs> well, the biggest plus, so when we're talking plus, for, just to be clear, we, we're, we're trying to do away with lockdowns. So, uh, and there's a whole discussion you can have about the different forms of lockdown and so on. But, but let's say we're really trying to do away with them. We want people to be able to go to school, go to work, socialise, um, and, and so we're talking about a plus that allows all of that to, to continue. My view, and I think many on this, um, uh, at this webinar and, and perhaps you two as well might not agree with me, but my view is that Australia's biggest failing in the pandemic is not being the vaccine program. It, you know, there's clearly problems with it, um, but, but a the Australian government has been passionate about vaccines as a solution right from day one and, and bet on five horses, not on one horse. They got a bit unlucky with a few who were victims of, um, of their own success, actually. The, the thing that is hard, makes a vaccine roll out hard is to have no, vac no COVID. Anyway, th there's problems with it. I'm not saying we couldn't have done better with a vaccine roll out. Clearly, we could have. Uh, but it's not the big problem. The big problem is recognising and acting on the fact that this is a infection transmitted by the air you know so we're still we're still into hand washing and uh, and disinfecting and deep cleaning places that are contaminated and so on um, i'm not saying you shouldn't do that but we've we've way moved on to say that that the biggest risk is um, sharing a room with somebody who's infected or who's gone and was infected Transmission through the air. That's why we banged on about hotel quarantine all that time. Apply, you know, for and and everything that related to our border protection. Um, we were having outbreaks all the time from hotel quarantine because we weren't taking airborne transmission seriously. So the absolute core of the plus is to recognise that it's a virus transmitted by the air, and to mitigate that in every way, shape, or form. So let's let's start with masks because there's masks. 
proven to be very effective at a community level, including in Australia, which should be leading to saying, well, that's our baseline. We've, we know masks work. How can we make them work much better? Uh, how can we be much smarter and much more effective with, with our masks, with the sort of masks people have, with the compliance of mask uptake? We, I don't see much work on that at all. And yet it's the same to me as trying to improve our vaccine coverage. Vaccines we know work, masks we know work, why aren't we trying to improve them? So masks are the first thing. But the, the revolution is in air quality in our indoor spaces. So it sounds a throwaway line, ventilation, open the windows. Um, I mean a revolution that treats the air like we treat water. So, you know, the, the, the two big health revolutions in the world, the reason why life expectancy is increasing in every population in the world is the firstly because we recognise that pathogens were transmitted through water. So hygiene, sanitation, when they kicked in, we had massive improvements in childhood mortality and therefore life expectancy. The second was vaccines. That's why the last 40 years have been so successful. Uh, under five mortalities increased so, so much. But the missing link has been recognising as a globe from WHO through to Australia that the air and air quality, not just for pathogens, is so, so important. So I'm looking to low-hanging fruit, but also to formal regular regulation as to how air quality be, can, can be improved. And schools, as you said, kicking off in Victoria, they'll have CO2 meters in classrooms, which ones are good, which ones are bad, what can we do to mitigate it? You can use HEPA filtration and so on to improve air quality where you can't open the doors. So the, the core elements of PLUS, apart from test, trace and isolate, and we can get really clever about that with rapid antigen testing and so on that we might talk about, but the in addition to, to that is mitigating transmission through the air. And uh, that needs a lot more discussion. And I hope we're just at the beginning point of, um, of a revolution in that regard. Um, we're supposed to go to questions from the audience, but I actually have two more things that I want to ask you about first. So one is to come back to that point that you were making about other states opening up when there's such high levels of infection in, for example, in um, Sydney, uh, like... Richard and I are here in Canberra, completely surrounded by New South Wales and only a couple of hours down the highway. Um, you know, Queensland's still got its borders shut, but um, that was one thing that really struck me about your comments there. Like, it just seems nuts to me that, um, you know, people would considering opening up when there is such huge outbreaks happening. And I know that the ACT, the Chief Minister here has talked about, well, if New South Wales is at 80% and opening up, we're going to be at 90%. Like he's much more ambitious for the ACT. But the, the thing that um, really strikes me most is um, at the moment, parents um, worrying about children because they can't access the vaccinations at the moment and what a vulnerable um, population they are. Could you tell me a little bit about that and um, if there's anything that um, I guess parents should know? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good and very vexed um, uh, issue, of course, in Australia at the moment. I mean, we are going to see, uh, at the moment, our vaccine program is, is 16 and above. It's going to be 12 and above, uh, very, very likely. You know, there's some some regulatory uh, uh, hurdles to go through, and then practical ones of availability and so on. Um, but but I think we will we're very likely to see that kick in, and that will help both protect um, those kids, and I'll come to uh, risk for for those kids in a moment. Uh, but but also um, as a secondary issue, helps reduce transmission in in the community more generally, which is good not just for the kids but for the more vulnerable adults who couldn't or didn't get vaccinated for, for whatever reason. So um, that's going to happen. And then, then the issue is when will we get kids younger than that vaccinated? Uh, there's various trials going on at the moment. You don't just give the same dose of the same vaccine. So that work has to, has to go on with Moderna and BioNTech and, and AstraZeneca and so on and is happening now. And then our TGA will consider it and then we'll have that debate in Australia. The fact of the matter is um, kids are far less susceptible to uh, severe disease and, and, you know, really young ones are different to, 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 older, to uh, older ones. But as a general rule, 
they're far less susceptible um, to severe disease. So that's the good side. And that's where you see the argument in the UK happening that we don't need to vaccinate them and, and so on. Um, my view is that what you will end up seeing, though, is that there's very low disease in kids, but not no disease in kids. Uh, and, and when the numbers are really high, you will have lots of kids in hospital um, and you will have deaths and very seriously unwell kids at quite some numbers. Not because it's frequent, it's incredibly infrequent. But if, if the virus is allowed to go through them unchecked, un, um, uh, then you will find that this is a huge issue. Uh, no question at all. And I think we're getting an understanding of that we have a lot of really sensible people in this country, in this space, who, who wrestle with it, who say, look, we want kids to go to school, and as I do. We want kids to go to school, we want kids to go to crash, we want people, kids to have an open society. We certainly don't want them to get COVID. So that's what's driving in Victoria, uh, that tension is what's driving this effort to mitigate schools, to say, okay, is there any way we can have schools open and, and make them the safest possible environment by vaccinating the teachers, vaccinating the older kids, um, instigating mask wearing, instigating ventilation strategies, instigating rapid testing approaches um, for themselves. But my own view is that we need to head toward uh, kids, even quite young kids, being vaccinated, not as first priority by, by any means. Um, and we can maybe get to 80% of the total population vaxxed without it. That's kind of what the data is saying we're going to need to, to really have less of the plus, not no plus. Um, and, and that experiment's playing out in a few places in the world. So Singapore, for example, is up at 80%. Singapore is looking at an 80% future with test, trace and isolate, very active and low numbers. That's their strategy uh, in, a, in, a tentative, in a tentative way. And I think uh, you know, every place is different, but that's the strategy that we need to adopt as well. And it's much easier to get to your 80% plus if kids are vaccinated, but it's not the reason to vaccinate the kids. The reason to vaccinate the kids is for the kids. Yeah. Richard, you're a parent uh, and you understand numbers there. <laughs> what are your concerns? Uh, yeah, same. And look, to be honest, yeah, you know, parents worry about their kids. Of course they do. And, you know, one in a thousand kids winding up in hospital. Well, if I had a thousand kids, one of them would go to hospital. So, you know, I can take a lot of comfort from that. Uh, but, you know, there's more than a thousand kids at my son's high school. So let's be clear, as Brendan said, while the probabilities are very low for kids, because we're talking about a virus that's, that's going to move through pretty much the whole unvaccinated population in time, a large number of kids are going to wind up in ICU, a large number of kids are going to get quite sick and tragically uh, a an, an not insignificant number are going to die. So we, we have to confront that. And you know, to put it into perspective, we again, we talk about 70 and 80 percent all the time. We're only at 40 percent in New South Wales. So we're a long way from this fantasy football of 70 or 80 percent of the adult population. When you do the, you know, people don't, not you, Ebony, but everyone else struggles with percentages. So let's just talk about people, not percentages. The target that we've set is when we hit our target, there'll be 9.2 million unvaccinated Australians. 9.2 million, 5.1 million kids under 16, 4.1 million adults over 16. That's a lot of unvaccinated people. And if only a small percentage of those people get very sick, it's a very small percent of a very large number. That's why other countries have set more ambitious targets. That's why in the ACT, the chief minister is saying, I want a lot more than that. Because we, we're, what, we're not having a debate here about science. We're having a debate about democratic decision-making. How much risk should we collectively take in order for us to collectively give up some freedoms? And there's no right answer here in the Doherty modeling or anything else. And different people are gonna make different decisions. But, we need to understand that what the Doherty modelling assumes is there'll be 9.2 million unvaccinated people. And perhaps surprisingly, people don't realise that according to Doherty, if we open up at 80%, we wind up with 40,000 cases a day six months later. 
So when the prime minister says, Dawadi says it's safe to open up, the word safe is not mentioned in the Dawadi modeling. But what the Dawadi modeling does say is if we open up at 80% of adults, we wind up with 40,000 cases a day in some pretty optimistic scenarios. And they're the kind of risk return questions that it's okay, that it's important for us to have a democratic debate about, not pretend that once we hit 70% or 80%, everything's fine. And you know, I think what Brendan's just said about treating quality of air the way we treat quality of water is fascinating. What a great national goal to set for ourselves, not just for COVID, Imagine if we treated air that well, whether it comes to particulate pollution, whether it comes to dust in the workplace, what a, what a great 21st century public health goal to have. It might just also help us not kill a lot of people from COVID in the short term. Yeah. Um, I'll go to questions from the audience now. And I know we've got about 700 people on the line with us today. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Um, there's a couple of people in here either living in the ACT or Victoria um, with an intense feeling of frustration that all their efforts have been undermined by New South Wales failure to control their outbreak. Feelings aside, uh, James Bannon asks, is this fair? Does Delta's variance in infectiousness mean that we would have been in this situation regardless of New South Wales? Brendan, do you want to take that one? Uh, look, I'm well, you know, on the record many times as saying there was more we could have done to reduce the, the risk. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't, I couldn't stand here and say there's no chance we would have had, ever had a Delta outbreak like this. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we had a casual attitude, not just New South Wales, nationally and state by state, this, this improved over time, casual attitude to our borders. Uh, people will hate me for saying that, but if you don't mitigate airborne transmission, you don't admit that the virus transmits that way, um, in, a, in a really full frontal way, because that was myth busting with needed full frontal admission and therefore have, uh, you know, hotels with the right pressurisation and so on and, and masks and, 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 you know, drivers wearing you know, N95 masks and so on. If you don't have that, you're going to have frequent outbreaks. We had frequent outbreaks. And then on top of that, we had... Um, a state that didn't want to go hard early, that would do the opposite to what I consider standard pandemic practice, shut down really early at a very high, very low numbers with very high containment, and then ease off as you get to control. Instead, it took 10 days to do any lockdown, then it was lockdown light, then it was lockdown medium, then it was lockdown heavy, then it was regional uh, lockdown as well. And so, yes, there's definitely more that they could have done. Then we've got incursions in in uh, three different states and in New Zealand that have had to, um, you know, that have come from, from the larger numbers in New South Wales. So I share the frustration, um, but we just are where we are. I do feel that New South Wales was really committed to COVID zero. I do feel that that was genuine. They, they proved that by getting back to COVID zero a number of times in the past and, um, and, and just got confident, I suspect, of their ability to do it in a different way and so came unstuck. Um, I don't subscribe to the fact they deliberately gave up COVID zero. They came unstuck. And so we, we are now where we are. And, and there's just no alternative but to do what they're doing, which is relatively heavy lockdown, vaccinate like crazy. Let's have the curve turn. Then we can have lots of discussion as the curve turns. Burnett modelling released yesterday in the 12 LGAs says it might happen as soon as a week or two's time. Um, we've got other modelling to say, you know, done in a different way, it might take a bit longer than that. Um, whatever the case, it will eventually, the curve will turn. New South Wales has to stay in lockdown uh, until that time. And then as, the, as we come down off the slope, um, you know, steadily things can, as vaccine rates continue to go up, you can experiment with, well, can we open X or can we open Y and test whether that works. And look, you can have all of the commentary from the Prime Minister and the Premiers and so on. In the end, what's going to determine um, whether we're in lockdown or not is threats to our health system. Uh, that is what's going to drive it. Uh, so, you know, you can talk about we're going to be open by Christmas. Well, we might or might not. Depends on whether uh, our health system is still uh, overwhelmed at that stage or not. Um, I like chances in New South Wales, but I, as I've said earlier, I would find it really hard to see how 
the rest of Australia is going to be in that position in Victoria. It is, a yeah, I sit in Victoria. It's frustrating from my point of view, who's banged on about these issues for a long period of time. But I've got to give that up. We are where we are now. We have to deal with the circumstance we've got. What I will say for places that are COVID zero is that the onus should be on places that are not to protect them. It's not just up to uh, West Australia, South Australia and Queensland to protect themselves. The onus is on those of us with COVID to do what we can to protect them while they get vaccinated. They're way behind the other states in vaccines. We've got to get them you know, uh, vaccinated as, as quickly as possible. It serves no one to have virus get into uh, those states. It serves no one, certainly doesn't serve uh, the nation until we're high enough vaccinated. That's not a conversation that's often had, um, but the onus is on us in Victoria and, and those in New South Wales to protect those who have either COVID zero or a chance of being it, the ACT um, and regional Victoria, hopefully regional New South Wales as cases in point. Mm. Ebony, can I, can I just add something to that? I mean, unfortunately, Gladys Berejiklian would rather have a conversation about why the other premiers should open up to her in a month's time than why she hasn't put a ring of steel around Sydney to protect regional New South Wales. So yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of blame shifting going on. You know, there's there's victim blaming of the people who were unvaccinated. Like, think about how we describe the people that get COVID. Oh, they were unvaccinated. Mm. Yeah. Oh, they only had one dose. Mm. Pre-existing oh, oh. condition. Had a pre-existing condition. Who cares? People are dying who were unvaccinated. They should have been vaccinated before they were exposed to this kind of risk. So at a micro level, we're blaming individuals. And at a federation level, we've got a state premier that did not lock down hard and early, blaming other states for ignoring a national plan when the national plan required her to lock down hard and early to prevent this situation arising. So I think it's very kind of Brendan and Victorians to, to admit that they kind of are where they are. That's good. We should look forward. But we can't forget how we got here. You know, there was a, a driver who wasn't wearing a mask who, who got infected in a quarantine breach. And then we didn't lock down hard in a population that wasn't vaccinated in anything like the rates that were, uh, occurred in other countries. Yes, we have to kind of grin and bear where we are and think about the future, but it's not individuals being vaccine hesitant with underlying conditions that caused this problem. And fantasy football about whether we get to fly to Perth at Christmas is irrelevant in a setting where this New South Wales Premier won't protect regional New South Wales from Sydney. Yeah, and uh, as someone with family members with uh, a lot of underlying conditions, I'm certainly not wild and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who really kind of resent that language every day um, when it's rolled out. Um, Richard, this next one might be for you as well. It's from David Bennett. He says... No relation, I don't think, David. Um, the words, I'm following the health advice is being used increasingly by politicians to really mean choosing which health professional aligns with what they want. But his question is, what's the best way to shine a spotlight on the modelling or advice assumptions and, you know, reveal that experts are going, uh, that pollies are going expert shopping until they find one that suits them? Maybe more commenting on the assumptions than the, the shopping around. How do people yeah. know what the assumptions are? Look, I've actually got a, a piece coming out, hopefully in the next couple of days, that looks at the, the reality of democratic decision making, and and whether it's uh, whether it's whether we provide free childcare to parents in Australia, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or lock down hard and early, it's entirely up to politicians, our elected representatives, to make decisions that they think are in their best interests. And, and who they draw advice from is a decision they get to make. When to draw advice and when to go with their gut is a decision they get to make. And, and unfortunately, modelling, you know, and my expertise is economic modelling, but I'm generalising here, modelling has become such a kind of uh, uh, we, we've put it on such a pedestal that we pretend that the modelling tells an elected representative what they should do. And it, it can't, it never does. And all the Doherty modelling does is spell out 
likely consequences for a small set of scenarios. So we always rely on our elected representatives to make decisions. Hopefully they take good scientific advice and broader advice as well. And then they have to make hard decisions. But when you hear people leaning as hard on a particular bit of modelling as the Prime Minister is, um, sure, you know, read the short paper I wrote recently on, it's up on our website, you know, eight things you need to know about Doherty. But the, the thing you need to know about is that no model tells a Prime Minister what they should do. The word should isn't really mentioned in the Doherty modelling. The word safe isn't mentioned. It's just a bunch of scenarios with possible consequences. And if there's heroic assumptions in there, like TTIQ always holds up pretty well, then the, the modeling's not gonna give us much insight into how the, how the virus will spread. That's not a fault of the modeler. It doesn't mean they were corrupted or bought off or cherry picked. It's just that modeling's already three months old and the world's changed a lot. Mm. The next question. Yeah, I would just, I'd just add, just to, to cap that off, to say, I mean, I, I uh, as an academic, could debate the Doherty model till the cows come home, but basically a top class group delivered a pretty sensible report. That's not the issue here. That is not the issue. Um, it's how that's then translated into public policy that is the, is the discussion, um, in my view. Mm, absolutely. Um, and as Richard has pointed out, we did a podcast on this last week. Um, you know, uh, Doherty was asked to model a couple of different scenarios as well. And Richard pointed out they, they weren't necessarily asked, what's the best way out of this? It was, no, that's right. yeah. Um, so the next question might be uh, for you, Brendan, it's from Linda Peach. She says, uh, has the whole debate really come down to quote, how many dead people will the Australian public be okay with provided they can have family get togethers and go to the footy again? <laughs> um, I wonder if just knowing that the Burnett Institute does have some modeling out, I guess, about deaths and overwhelming the health system like you were talking about today, uh, is that really where we're at? <laughs> yeah, perhaps not so much on, on, on deaths, but definitely overwhelming the health system. Um, look, it could be, we've always had a challenge to, to, you know, if you don't live and breathe, I'm not a doctor, but um, my partner is, and, and I um, am in an institute full of clinicians and on a hospital campus and in all the different countries we work, I'm involved in the health system. So it's really tangible to me how important health systems are, how, how um, you know, our whole society is based on the high quality of service that there is right from the prevention through to through to treatment but if you don't live and breathe that every day it does seem pretty abstract um, you know the stress that our and i hope there's, there's a number on this call but the the stress that our current healthcare workers in victoria and new south wales are under is unbelievable and it hasn't just reached it hasn't reached anything like its peak but it is unbelievable it is it is i don't know what it's like being a soldier but i liken it to because to see the trauma you know the anxiety with which they go to work and like it's absolutely palpable not to mention those who are who are um, waiting for an ambulance uh, much longer than they would otherwise waited and getting tense because because they're worried about whether they're having a heart attack or not you know this is going to become more and more the norm so making the connection between uh, these abstract numbers it's not the numbers of deaths that are going to motivate people um, you know, in the UK, they had 130 to 150,000 deaths. That hasn't made Boris Johnson hugely unpopular from my point of view. Numbers don't seem to work. I don't know why. Um, uh, it's, it's something to do with deeply understanding uh, that, you know, for those who do suffer, for those who are on the front line fighting this war for us, it's such a big deal. And to put them under the strain that we're putting them under is, is in a preventable way is completely unfair. So to have a conversation about, I'd really like to have my Christmas. So um, the price I'm willing to pay is for those other people to go through that um, is a conversation we have to have because that is a, a society that's not functioning properly. Mm. 
Yeah, and can I just ask you about that modelling that is out today from Burnett? Um, from what I can see or the, from what The Guardian's reporting, I haven't read it myself yet, it kind of looks at the different levels um, as New South Wales goes through the peak and hopefully goes through to the other side and the stresses um, on intensive care units in particular. And, you know, in a worst case scenario, it's kind of talking about um, resource based decision making may have to be activated. So you're talking about, you know, ambulances having to wait, but in the ICU themselves, um, what is what in a worst case scenario, uh, if it does get overwhelmed, what is resource based decision making? Is that triage? Is that what you're talking about there? Deciding who gets care? I mean, but the, the modelling that um, did get released related to the 12 LGAs in Sydney, where most of the cases at the moment are, not for the whole of, of New South Wales, but it's not a bad proxy uh, for the moment because it's got, you know, the large proportion. And um, modelled a couple of scenarios, both when the cases might peak, as I mentioned earlier, and how high hospitalisations might get. And there were some assumptions in there that this is very much interim modelling, the modelling team tells me. There are assumptions... Uh, could, could change in a few weeks, but it effectively says that um, hospital demand between two and 4,000 people in those 12 LGAs um, is, and a little bit higher than that for, for, all of, uh, for all of Greater Sydney is likely to be the peak. Now, they're, they're pretty big numbers. ICU demand of, uh, of 600 to 1,000 or so uh, people in those 12 LGAs of concern. Now, what that means, you'd have to ask New South Wales Health, who have an exceptionally good ICU system, and they're the ones who have released this, uh, this, this modelling, this modelling we did uh, for them. You know, what else happens when your ICU is running at capacity? Remember, ICUs are running before you have COVID. So they're running already. They're running for all sorts of things. All right. So you don't have... Hard yeah, attacks. absolutely. They're, they're running all the time. And of course, they're going to have to continue to run for that. Uh, so, you know, you need good explanations from government as to how they're going to cope with it. Now, they, they are pretty good at saying we'll have surge capacity. We will increase the number of beds. We'll increase the number of ventilators. And I've, I don't doubt that that will happen. Um, what they're less good at saying is how they're going to staff that and what are they going to give up for that to happen? What's not going to happen so well because the surge capacity you know, emergency doctors are going over to, to uh, manage ICU patients or ventilation or, or nurses or um, other healthcare workers, you know, what gives? And, and so we've given the, the, the numbers, which say, at least in those 12 LGAs, it's a very worrying outlook, um, to say the least. And so the, the, the discussion is not so much with those numbers, um, but how they're going to, how they're going to cope um, with, with this extra demand more than just COVID, more than just supplying extra beds and extra ventilators. Um, I'm not close enough to the health system to be able to answer that. One thing I know is that uh, New South Wales and Sydney City is probably one of the best places, if not the best place in Australia to do this. So, you know, it's going to get even harder when it's in this town or I'm in, in Melbourne or, or, or in other places. I'm happy to stand corrected, but that is... That is my understanding. So a huge challenge ahead and whether that will translate to the community, as I've said, um, uh, you know, you look at what's happened in the UK, 600,000 people dead. Uh, obviously, health, hospital systems overwhelmed, depending on what state you're in and so on. And, uh, and yet still so much. Um, I wouldn't say that's led to the whole community being on board with this, this whole pandemic thing and, and, and controlling it you know, by getting vaccinated, by wearing masks and so on. So I don't know what that mental break is. Uh, I don't think our modelling is going to affect it. There has to be a real human connection made, starting with our leaders, between that suffering and between our frontline soldiers um, and, and themselves who are one step removed from that. Uh, and and we, we are nowhere near making that connection. That's when we'll make a difference to, as a society, try to stamp this out. Yeah, Richard, we hear a lot about, you know, thanks every day for them doing it, but not much in the way of pay bumps or massive recruitment drives and other things. Or, or taking the pressure off them. And that's, I think, really the point Brendan's making. So imagine we were talking about firefighters, not soldiers. And imagine we had bushfires raging across New South Wales. 
and someone said, well, why don't you have a total fire ban, you know, across the whole state to give the firefighters a bit of a chance? And, and we said, oh, but Christmas is coming up and people like to have a barbecue. We'll just, we'll just assume the firefighters will just fight and fight and fight because it's time to have a barbecue. The, the, the load that we're pushing, putting on the staff, I think it's incomprehensible. And look, on a personal note, someone dear to me uh, had a heart attack this week and went to hospital and by all accounts was 10 minutes away from dying. Now, if the ambulance had been 10 minutes slower and, or the intensive care ward had been 10% fuller, uh, they would have died. So again, we, it's not just about COVID. If we're going to put our health system under this much pressure, a whole bunch of other things are going to crack. And I just don't think talking about freedom and caves and Christmas is 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 the way to support these health workers the way to support them is to continue to do everything we can to not put them through that ordeal that marathon that is not they're, they're still running up the hill you know and yeah, we don't absolutely. even know how far away the peak is yeah uh well we might have to end it there you can find the burnet institute's modeling that brendan described there um as i said he made the point that's only for the 12 lgas in new south wales i hadn't um quite clocked that so go and check it out yourself that'll be on the burnet institute's website you can find richard's um look at the assumptions under the doherty institute modeling on the australia institute's website that's australia yeah. institute dot org dot au thank you so much brendan and richard for joining us today i for one found that a really just an, a much nicer discussion than what i hear on the television every day with all those press conferences so i appreciate all the nuance and the detail you've gone into there thanks everyone for your fantastic questions as always i'm sorry we couldn't get to them all um and just a reminder we've got two more webinars this week tomorrow at 11 a.m we'll be talking um to uh four different people from legal health and uh community activists justice reinvestment backgrounds about raising the age of criminal responsibility and getting children out of prisons kids as young as 10 are being locked up that's not the case in other countries and we can do better we'll be talking about that national campaign tomorrow that's at 11 and on friday um, at 1 p.m our center for responsible technology is doing its fortnightly tech talk this week they're looking at um, the regulation of explicit content on online platforms like only fans uh, so that should be an interesting discussion you can find that at center for responsible technology.org.au and make sure you subscribe to our podcast follow the money where we take big economic issues and explain them in plain english you can find that on itunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts and again um, the last episode i think was Rich and I are talking about um, the Doherty Institute modelling and the national plan. So check it out. Thanks so much for coming along today. We really appreciate it. Um, and thanks for your time, Brendan and Richard. No, thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. Thanks, See you, Richard. Bye. The bottom 20% uh, uh, get nothing. They're really unfair tax cuts. People want to see much stronger action from the government when it comes to climate change. It's no coincidence that we have a wages crisis in Australia. Transitioning to net zero emissions, it doesn't seem like there's much room for gas. 